no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Committee and Delegation Reports, Order of the Day Number 1, Report of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, Review of the Defence Annual Report 2010-2011, Resumption of Debate on the Motion of the Member for Tangney. The question is that the document be noted. I call the Member for Fadden. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to note the work of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee in their report on the Defence Annual Report 2010-11 and put on my record my thanks to the Committee Secretariat for all of their work, including the Defence Advisor, Wing Commander Ashworth, for all of their assistance. It's interesting that this discussion in terms of the annual report is being held in the shadow of the fact that this morning the fourth Defence Secretary in four years announced their resignation. At least it complements, I suppose, the third Defence Minister in four years and 15 ministerial reshuffles in the defence portfolio in four years. Considering in the early days uh, of Department of Defence, over the last 100 years, secretaries stayed on average seven or eight years. Their terms are five years. But in the last four years, rather than one secretary staying for the five years, we've had four in four years. But the government said there's nothing to worry about here. There's nothing wrong here. There is no way that you can look at four secretaries in four years and say that there is anything other than a significant, egregious problem in the Defence Force, precipitated by the minister's action and the minister's interrelationship with the Defence Force. And it is not hard to see how and why this is built to this point. Whilst the annual report covers it in detail, the last four years, $25 billion have been stripped from defence budget, $25 billion. 22,000 single soldiers, sailors and airmen and women had their return trip home cancelled. A condition of service dispensed with. And if it wasn't for the coalition's disallowance motion, which the government rolled over and caved into last Thursday, whereby that entitlement to try to fly home for Christmas has been re-established. If it wasn't for the coalition's disallowance motion, 22,000 of our finest would have a condition of service taken away from them. $25 billion cut, which includes $5.5 billion cut over the next or this year and the three-year forward estimates, a 10 per cent cut in the defence budget this year. Defence budget as a proportion of GDP, the lowest since 1937 and next year purported to be lower again, this year 1.56 per cent of GDP, when it should be up towards 2 per cent. That's the expectation of NATO partners and NATO countries. It should be at 2 per cent. The Defence Annual Report speaks glowingly about uh, Plan Besheba and the closeness between regular and reserve forces in terms of the force generation cycle being introduced. Yet these budget cuts produce cuts of 35 per cent to the reserves and something like 30 per cent to cadets. 11,000 cadets we have. The cadet leaders were paid 48 days a year to train those cadets, now being cut to 33.5 days. So the work and the forward projections from the Defence Annual Report 2010-2011 are now meaningless because of these substantial budget cuts. In a fourth generation cycle, where a battalion task force size group is required to rotate round with a regular brigade with only or with 35 per cent cuts in reserves, it will be difficult to see how a reserve unit will actually force generate that task group. The Defence Capability Plan, which is the plan that outlines the equipment, procurement and purchases, has been cut because of these or this budget by 46 per cent of projects have been impacted, either deferred or cancelled. And yet the electronic warfare aircraft, the Growler, the additions to the, the FA-18 Super Hornet, uh, has been announced, yet not budgeted $1.5 billion, and no one can yet articulate where that money is coming from. The answer is the DCP must be cut again, because there are no other funds for the government to pay for it from. The future submarine, $214 billion worth, is an announcement four years too late and puts our submarine force in terms of its replacement in a perilous situation. Land 121 Phase 3, which was announced 
uh, Rheinman in terms of their trucks were announced as the preferred vehicle at the end of last year. There has been no announcement from the government that that contract is complete. Ten months to do a contract to buy trucks? Is there any greater example that this government is making it up as they go along? Of course, a new white paper is announced because apparently the uh, security situation in our region has changed. The changes since 2009 would seem to be linear and not egregious. The issue is that the government has cut the budget. So with a reduced budget, the 2009 white paper is now universally considered to be irrelevant and deserves its place in the waste paper bin. A new white paper is now being rushed through, which is odd, including the secretary having departed today, as to what impact that will have on the white paper. The coalition will simply scrap the 2013 white paper if elected. You cannot rush through a white paper. You cannot situate a strategic appreciation based on the paucity of funds that you are prepared to allocate and say that this is a sound, holistic, well thought through defence strategy. It is simply farcical. There is no industry policy to speak of, certainly not one that will actually survive contact with the Labor Party. The $5.5 billion worth of cuts include a 30 per cent cut to expenditure for industry this year. Companies will go to the wall. Hundreds, if not thousands, of employees will lose their job. R&D in the defence space will suffer. Whatever industry policy the government said they had for defence is now worthless. The priority, priority industry capabilities and strategic industry capabilities, PICS or SICS, are now universally considered to actually have no funding attached to them and no relevance with them. And the question is, what's the government's response? And it's great the member from Morton is here on the other side of the table. He did a, a, a press conference this morning uh, and reading through the transcript, he was asked about the defence cuts and what impact they were having. And what did the member for Morton give us? He gave us an introduction into Australia's commitment to the Boer War at the time of Federation. He then spoke of changes in the last 20 and 30 years and then tried to weasel his way out of it. He couldn't explain succinctly the reason for the cuts. He couldn't outline the national security implications of the cuts. He couldn't outline the effect on the Queensland economy, especially in his electorate, because of the cuts. All he could give us was an expose on the Boer War, and apparently Campbell Newman is responsible for that as well. It was an appalling justification for a member of parliament trying to explain the defence cuts. Then I will table your press conference transcript tomorrow, sir, because it is one of the most appalling press conferences I have frankly seen, when a member of parliament couldn't even articulate the reason why the government has cut the guts out of the military, couldn't even articulate it. It was more embarrassing than anything else. So as we discuss the Defence Annual Report, as we look forward to the future, can I say the future is incredibly bleak in terms of this government's cuts to the defence. The future for our fighting men and women is not a strong future. It is not a future of capability development. It is not a future of capability investment. It is the same old Labor future of cuts cuts and cuts, robbing fighting Peter to pay social welfare poor. And in the words of the Treasurer, you seriously should be condemned for it.